Sure thing. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to bring up Steve Maurer. Uh, he'll provide a uh, update, a quarterly update on, uh, from the Economic Development Council's activities. Good evening. Again, my name is Steve Maurer. I am the chairman of the Independence Economic Development Council. We are your partners for economic development. We've presented here before, gonna try and not be redundant and tell you all the same things again, but as you know, our membership, we have 150 approximate members that voluntarily pay extra to join our organization to help promote independence growth through new business. Our quarterly update probably is the least kept secret of all because what we've been doing is North Point. And I think everybody's seen it and everybody's heard it and you've probably heard more than what you would ever want to know about North Point. So I'm not gonna talk about North Point, but I do want to give you two very important pieces of information about that relate to North Point. One is, how do we decide where we're gonna develop? And secondly, what kind of jobs are we looking for? And what type of rates are we looking for? And we thought we could provide some of that information. But before I do that, I have something very important. As you know, the one aspect of the Economic Development Council is we operate the Innovation Center out of the old hospital. And in partnership with the school district, we have a center that helps grow and develop and spawn new businesses. We have a new director of the Innovation Center, and she's here with us tonight. Her name is Danielle Dupree, and I want to give just a minute, let Ms. Dupree come up, introduce herself, and tell, her, tell you a little bit about her. Good afternoon. Um, I know many of you guys, but I come from a tech background, so I've been helping businesses grow through technology, um, AR, uh, AI, VR, and such. Um, right now, we have a good problem. We have about 33 businesses wanting to come into the Innovation Center. We have room for about four more. Um, in August, we are gonna have a big tenant leaving, so that's gonna open up more spots for that. And then on the second floor where we have our tech labs and our biotech labs and our traditional office spaces, I do have an interested party in taking uh, one of our thousand uh, square foot labs to put in an artist uh, artist workshop and artist instruction seminar. And that's about it. Thank you, guys. Well, I, if I can ask one question, and s sorry, Danielle. Sure. So when can I get a tour? Um, next week. All right, that'll work, because that, that'll free me up, too, and so maybe next Thursday or Friday, and so. And also, uh, feel free to ask any questions. And that's my philosophy is, and I hope that goes along with everybody's philosophy is, if you ask questions as you go along. So right. congratulations on the uh, job. Thank All you. the best, and I'm looking forward to a tour. So thank you. All right, thank you guys. You bet. Thanks, Danielle. A little bit about just a couple more facts about the Innovation Center, just so everybody knows. We have more people on a weekly basis coming to the Innovation Center to operate their business, to grow their business, to start their business, then work here in City Hall. That's the number of people that are coming in and out of the Innovation Center and spawning new development, new jobs, new growth and independence. And then our next goal is to get them to relocate from the Innovation Center to a spot here in Independence. I want to move to the two points that have come up about North Point. It, I've listened to all of the public comments and I've heard a lot of, and I've read a lot on social media, and two things seem to, to be unclear about what the EDC does. The first is, where do we look to develop? How do we decide, try to promote development like out in the valley? And you might recall, but I heard a very passionate public comment about our little blue valley and we, they, how keeping the pristine of our little blue valley and what we need to do in our little blue valley. Well, the first thing that we look for in where to develop is who owns the land and do they want to develop? Our Little Blue Valley does not belong to the city. It doesn't belong to the citizens. It's owned property, and it's owned primarily by the church. The church wants to develop their property, and so that puts them high on our radar. If you, are, if you own the property that could be developed, you're high on our radar to first be uh, developed. And we look at the zoning what it, and, the, and the plan from the city. What is the city planned for property? All of the Little Blue Valley is planned for development. 
I heard a great impassioned idea about let's turn the Little Blue Valley into a park and build boat ramps for, for kayaks and, and canoes on the river, and what a grand idea, except none of that Little Blue Valley is zoned for or planned for a park. The city didn't invest millions of dollars to build the roadway and all of the infrastructure for a park. All you have to do is drive down Little Blue Parkway and you see sitting out in the cornfield fire hydrants and sewer manhole covers. Those are not there for a park. Those are there because it was planned for development. So what do we look for? And the first and foremost is where does the city plan for development? Does the property owner want to develop? And is the property ready to be developed? All of those things come to roost and are true for the Little Blue Valley. That's why we look there, and that's why that's first and foremost on our list, and that's why North Point is there. The second thing is that I heard a lot about is, well, what kind of jobs? And there seemed to be a lot of misconfusion about $17 an hour, because the starting wage for North Point, as Mr. Chancellor said, was $17 an hour. And there seemed to be some confusion that, oh my gosh, $17 an hour, that's somehow bad, and it would be, not be a good job in independence. So I have some statistics for you. This is straight out of ZipRecruiter, and I'll uh, see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. But the, with an average hourly wage of $17, which is what North Point would do, this is what it would look like on the chart of wages today in independence. The vast majority of wages that are being paid every hour in independence are far shorter than $17. $17 an hour would be a dramatic improvement of the wage scale in independence. It would actually pull up our household income. It would make the wages better, particularly when you consider who's going to take those jobs. The, the single parent that's working two jobs with no benefits at $17 an hour, 40 hours a week with benefits, that's a godsend. And that would be an absolute improvement over what we currently have. How does that $17 an hour compare? If you, if you look at um, the starting pay and in independence, so what do, what do we have? Cargo Largo, which you all have approved. It's going to be a great new development. We're having it coming. What is Cargo Largo? Well, cashier makes $12.65. Starting retail associate is $13, and the warehouse is $14. North Point's jobs are better than what you've already approved and is already coming to independence. Sonico, they, they have $15 up to $17.40. A forklift driver gets $17.18. Olin Winchester, probably the best long-term, well-known employer in the, in the independence area. What do they start at? $15.45. What do they make after 120 days? $17. This is not a bad wage. Unilever is very consistent, Burden Fletcher, even the independent school district. I mean, you can't do better than working for the independent school district. They don't pay $17 an hour starting. I threw in the last two because Menards and Walmart, and I don't mean to say anything derogatory about retail. We need retail, and retail is good. But when you compare retail jobs and starting salary to the starting salary that's offered by industrial jobs, starting salary that's offered by the kind of development that we're looking for at North Point and in the Valley, it's dramatically better. And it's full time and it's with benefits. And you just can't compare. We have lots of retail jobs available. Those aren't the kind of jobs that we're looking for. And just so we can compare the starting, starting wages in the metro, Ford, Clay Como, one of the, the leading employers out of the entire metro area. $16 an hour. GM Fairfax, $12 an hour. Amazon, brand new, great big Amazon, came to, come, came to, the, to, the, to the whole metro, what do they pay? $14. JC Penney's one of the longest, long term in Lenexa, their distribution facility, they still average $15.43 starting wage. Aerotech is at $16. Simply put, there, any confusion about the starting wage in independence at $17 an hour is just that, confusion. $17 an hour would be a very, very good starting wage. But also you have to understand that a lot of the starting wage is going to depend upon the tenants that are able to come into North Point. Once we have the structures, the business park, the opportunities there, we will have an opportunity to locate and land 
businesses that are coming and investigating the metro all the time. Jody Krantz is going to tell you about three of those, but a large part of her job is responding to these opportunities through the KCADC, where they bring to us opportunities that are through the entire metro. But without the existing park, without the existing buildings ready to move in, we don't have a chance. And Jody's identified for you three opportunities that I think you'll see really would make a dramatic improvement to the starting wage and independence. <clears throat> the first two we have on here are actually a couple of missed opportunities, and they were just examples. Uh, like I said, we work with Kansas City Area Development Council. Um, they go out and they do marketing as a region. They have more of the funding that can do that, and then they send the projects out to the communities, and then we have to fill out an RFI request for information on the projects that we fit. And most of them we get, by far, come in wanting a building that's already built. Um, even projects that end up maybe building their own building usually won't look there's a, unless there's a building that's already look, that's already built. So this is an example here, and like average salary, 65,000. This is one that we missed. Do I advance? Yep. Just break it, break it up for you. Okay. There you go. And this is another one came from the Missouri Partnership. We also work with them in their division of the Missouri Department of Economic Development, and they have a lot of companies that are coming in and looking, and they'll send us their information and. And as you can see on this, this is kind of hard to read. It's very small. But it, they're looking at hiring 700 workers. Um, their pay, I'm not sure if I had the pay on this one. But these two are missed. These are two that came along when we didn't have anything, and we don't get to, to work with them now. But this next one is uh, we, we use a lot of code names because companies usually don't want out there you know, what they're doing until they're ready to announce to the public. But they came uh, to us a couple years ago. It was actually a, a lead from uh, somebody, a, a current business in Independence. And they wanted at least 100,000 square foot, and we didn't have it. So they started looking elsewhere in the metro. Um, this is kind of when COVID start hit, so they went away for a while. And uh, in talking to them recently, they are ready to take a look back at us. And you can see these are actual wages coming from the companies that they would be, that they would be paying. And they'll start up with 21 jobs, but eventually get up to 60. And these are starting wages too. You know, some of them are gonna go up. Same thing with what Steve was talking about was, you know, some of the, the businesses at North Point will start with $17 an hour wages, but they're gonna go up from there. Um, and also, you know, there's a good possibility, like these projects that I'm showing you now, they're not all warehouses. They're light manufacturing. And those usually tend to be a little bit higher wage rates also. So that's kind of just a, in a nutshell, what we see with companies um, looking here and what they need to, to come here. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. So what's next? Now I'm gonna leap forward and say that North Point's approved and they've already told you that if that happens, then they're gonna have, they're gonna hope to have an occupant in the building by August of 2023. Once the valley starts, we're gonna have development after development after development and we will be there as your economic development ambassadors to try and help grow that. We've already heard and listened to the community. There are at least two things that the community wants desperately. One is special retail. In particular, they want a, they want a grocery store. They want a big grocery store in the valley that can serve the valley so you don't have to drive all the way to 23rd Street to go to the grocery store. We've already made those contacts. We're already working on that. And of course, the answer is, hey, once you get everything started, come, you know, let us know, we'll come look. North Point's very interested because some of the plan uh, further to the south of the valley, in the valley, is for retail. We, but we want to make it the right retail and retail that meets the community's needs. The other thing is housing. 5,000 new jobs relates roughly to 20,000 new people. And we have the opportunity to put in high quality housing, all types of housing, housing that we can bring to the community. We have already been approached by developers wanting to talk about housing, and the answer is always, once you get it approved and it gets started, we wanna be there. And it's amazing, because then they wanna be first. And so they're lining up ready to come to Independence to help us build and grow and fill these needs, but we don't have the opportunity yet because at all of the domino, the first domino has to fall. So I wanted to just give you a little bit about that, and I wanna close with this. It is a very exciting time to be involved in independence and economic development, but it is not always true. We have a huge reputation to overcome. This is a quote by Mark Donovan. Mark Donovan is the president of the Kansas City Chiefs. 
The Kansas City Chiefs are the number one brand in our metro. There is no business that is better known in the Kansas City metro than the Chiefs. And this man is the business president of the Chiefs. He was recently interviewed about moving the stadium. And the big talk that, that got all the publicity was moving to Kansas. But there was also part of that interview, well, if you don't like where you're at, maybe you could move to someplace else in Jackson County. Now, it was all of Jackson County, but his answer said, when you look at it from an investment standpoint, I'm not sure Independence, Missouri is the best place to develop. That's the reputation that we have. That's what we have to overcome. But if North Point puts a billion dollars into our community and everything else that we know is coming, that's development and numbers that would even get the attention of the Kansas City Chiefs, a billion dollars. And so I share that with you to let you know that it's not easy. We have a lot of work to do, but we have an unprecedented opportunity to make a change. Unless there's any questions, that's all we have. Any questions? Thank you, my Thank friend. you very much. Good job. And uh, Adam, could we get Mark Donovan on the uh, study session in the future to defend his comments? <laughs> Would that, what, 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 what do the other council members think about that? Would that be good to have him in here to defend his comments? Yeah, while I'm in here. Uh, so. <laughs> go, for, go for it. Go for it, tough guy. Yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm asking for everybody's help. I'm not doing it by myself. This is a we thing. This is a we thing. Uh, so, sorry, Adam, I got us off track. Uh, so, what's the, the next item on the agenda, please? You bet. All right. So, uh, a few months ago, uh, the city council requested kind of a summary or an update on the various programs and activities uh, the city does as a, for our own employees and out in the community relative to mental health services. Uh, this is certainly an emerging and challenging issue that, that we face as employees, uh, particularly our public safety personnel, something that they encounter on a, on a routine basis in the community. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to talk about what we offer and what, kind of where we're headed. Uh, there's much work ahead of us, so this is certainly kind of ground floor stuff here. So I would introduce uh, Assistant to the City uh, Manager, Sam Morris. She'll uh, kick this off and then introduce, uh, we have three other guest speakers tonight. Okay. okay. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Sam Morris. Um, it was a great introduction. He, he took half of it from me there, guys. <laughs> Um, one of the, the leading things that individuals are asking when looking for a new position is what does that company offer when it comes to mental health, whether that be uh, day, paid days off for mental health, whether that be opportunities that they have that they're able to reach out to and utilize uh, services not only outside but also within the organization itself. And so it's important for us as a city um, with 1,100 employees to make sure that we are addressing those issues, that we um, are providing things and, and resources for employees to be able to use, and we're also getting feedback from them to determine what resources or if those resources are adequate and up to par with what we expect from these um, particular organizations. So what we did is we partnered with CBiz in uh, November of 2021. We sent out a survey that specifically addressed the well-being, um, both mental and emotional uh, well-being of our employees, asking for just some feedback as to how they perceive the culture. Um, and needless to say, one of the top three answers that was given was, we need to be talking more about our emotional and mental well-being. We need to be offering more services. We need to be doing more. We need to take a more proactive rather than reactive approach to this. And so in, in doing that, we, we brought together uh, Cigna as well into that conversation, and we have been offering uh, some mental, uh, I'm sorry, some lunch and learns, um, offered those to, to our employees. Uh, we have also offered some health coaching. Uh, we've partnered with a couple different uh, places to do that, whether it be nutritional health coaching. Um, we also have an on-site uh, coach that is a wellness manager um, that we, we have the ability to reach out to um, and utilize their services as well. Uh, and then back in January, uh, we did a training for about 30 of our managers. They went through approximately a 20-hour training course where they were certified under a mental health first aid. Um, it, I was one of them. Uh, we have several that are, 
are with us tonight that have gone through that training. Um, it, was, it was definitely intense, but it gives an inside look as managers as to what we need to be looking at with our employees and our direct reports and, and even just our coworkers in general. We need to be looking out for each other um, and ensuring that if we're seeing something uh, that we bring it to that, that individual's attention. So tonight, um, as Deputy City Manager Norris uh, indicated, we have the privilege of being able to hear from three individuals tonight. Uh, John Burrell is one of our very own. He comes to us with 20 years of experience in both firefighter and paramedic work, as well as emergency services. And John uh, has, he also flies as a flight paramedic for Life Flight Eagle, as well as working as a medical specialist for FEMA on their search and rescue teams. Uh, and starting in November of 2021, John was put on assignment to develop an effective alternative 911 response program for the City of Independence. And so I've asked him to come and share his experience. John? Uh, good evening. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come to speak with you uh, about this program. Many years ago, um, I was an ambulance on a, on a paramedic, or I was a... Uh, I was a paramedic on an ambulance, and I was uh, dispatched to a psychiatric response in a rural community. Uh, we arrived, and, and there were firefighters and paramedics uh, with the patient. The patient said he was feeling uh, depressed, uh, feeling lonely, um, just something wasn't right. He denied suicidal thoughts, um, denied any medical issues, but there was something about his countenance that was particularly, uh, particularly concerning. We tried to, try to get him to go to the ER, um, but he had been to the ER before. He understood that the, uh, the emergency medical system is particularly challenging when it comes to mental health issues, um, in, in ERs in particular. I distinctly remember the circle of us standing around him um, trying to figure out what to do. None of us had really any good answers for mental health issues. Uh, we had no idea really as to the state of his mind. Um, I, I knew he shouldn't be left alone, but he hadn't made any particular statements uh, that wouldn't allow him to, uh, to refuse care with us. While we were doing all this, there were other 911 calls coming in. Our radios are going off, and, and he sensed that. Um, at that point, he started to back off and say, ah, no, guys, I don't, I don't need anything. I'm good. No issues. So uh, we went ahead and left, went to other calls that were waiting for us in the community. And I, I remember as, as I was walking away, I said, hey, will you please follow up with your mental health care provider tomorrow morning, first thing, because that's, that's an important thing to do. Less than 24 hours later, um, we were again called back to that residence for, for what, would, what would turn out to be a fatal drug overdose. Losses happen in emergency services. We understand that as part of the job. Um, you can do everything right and you can still lose. Uh, in these moments, we can, tell, we can tell someone's family, we can tell one another, uh, we can tell ourselves that uh, we did everything we could, um, that the system and our training gave uh, that patient every chance. I don't think that was the case with that guy, um, or many others uh, that would come after him. Uh, thankfully, they, they don't typically end that, that tragically, um, but that's an increasingly common scenario for first responders. Um, in those circumstances, we're, we're educated to the standards of our profession. Uh, we're prepared according to the expectations and resources of our organizations, but there's little we can do to offer immediate expertise, immediate resources, or immediate solutions. Um, it's not comfortable to talk about these things. We're, we're supposed to be solutions people. We show up at 2 a.m., we have the answers, and if we don't have the answers, we can get, to, get you to someone that does have the answers. Um, but it's difficult to avoid that there's a growing number of 911 requests where we struggle to find ways to help those in need. Um, whether we see it in our work, um, in the news, in social media, there's been quite a bit of talk lately given to the growing discussion of first responders' responsibilities and the community expectation of those responsibilities during 911 requests. Many of these incidents, uh, I would say, exist kind of on the margins of 911. Um, they are significant enough for emergency activation and response, but they're, they're often mismatched with the emergency and, and resource-heavy response of fire, police, and EMS organizations. Uh, you can sometimes call these requests, or maybe loosely define them as a quality of life challenges. Um, in the context of 911, this, this includes issues such as poverty, um, homelessness, substance abuse, mental health, and domestic issues. I, I don't need to tell you all there's no mistaking um, that these challenges are becoming more and more widespread. 
Uh, two recent studies that actually just came out through the CDC noted that um, drug overdose deaths in the U.S. reached the highest point ever recorded in 2021, uh, with more than 100,000 deaths over a 12-month period. Uh, 2021 saw a, the end of a 20-year trend of increasing national suicide rates. That's a 30% rise in 20 years from the year 2000. Um, independence, of course, is not immune to these issues. Um, in my report, uh, I detailed several very concerning trends for both mental health and substance abuse in our city and our state. Uh, the most concerning, uh, arguably the most concerning, was noting that according to state and national data, independence of suicide rate has consistently exceeded both national and state averages by a wide margin from 2010 to the most recent data in 2019. Our first response agencies, especially Independence Police Department, have, they have not been idle as they face these things. Um, they continue uh, to adapt their response systems to manage these community challenges in the context of 911 response. But there are limits to what extent they can adapt their roles and maintain focus and proficiency in protecting the public. In November of 2020, 2021, I was tasked with exploring options for a city-based alternative response program. This study resulted in the report that, that you all have received in conjunction with this presentation, um, as well as introducing independence to the small world of alternative 911 response. And it, it, is, it is fairly small. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there are only a handful of true alternative 911 response programs um, nationwide, with only one of those being older than five years old. Alternative response is a paradigm shift in how 911 operates. The entire basis of this whole concept is that fire, police, and EMS are not always the most appropriate resources to send to 911 calls. Instead, there is another option, sometimes a better option, for low-risk, quality-of-life 911 requests. Independence Community Outreach Response to Emergencies, or, or CORE for short, is, the, is a proposal to initiate a pilot alternative response program in our 911 system. In this proposed pilot program, a core response van uh, staffed with a mental health professional and a paramedic would be linked into the 911 system as a response asset. Uh, when on duty, this unit would be available to immediately respond to low risk, quality of life 911 requests, much the same way that police, fire, and EMS are dispatched out right now. The core program offers the benefit of being specifically designed to address immediate, low risk community needs at the time of the 911 request and having the time to do so, as that's their only job. Uh, some of these needs can include an immediate mental health evaluation and, and a transport to a dedicated mental health facility. Um, could be immediate connection to substance abuse resources, specialists in housing at 2 a.m. if we need be. Um, or it can be immediate communication with commu community members who have called 911 over low acuity issues and offer education to them or, or let them know kind of what the system is capable of and capable of not doing. Um, a couple other features I'm actually kind of excited about, in, in addition to 911 response, we're investigating other ways that we can provide family and responder support. One of the ways we're looking at right now is partnering with Children's Mercy Hospital, um, where families of children with mental health issues, when they're discharged back to independence homes, would have the option to opt in to having core mental health providers show up at their house at a convenient time to check up on their status and how they're doing. It's an investment in our kids' future, especially in their mental health futures. Um, or utilizing core mental health professionals for immediate family and first responder support right after a, a critical 911 incident, if it's on the scene or at a station. The capabilities of an alternative 911 response program in independence that really are substantial. We can make it what we need it to be. Um, in several existing cases, cities have adapted their alternative 911 response programs to address specific needs that they've identified in their communities. Recently, uh, a 911 call was made in a large metropolitan city. A 911, this 911 request was for a woman in a homeless camp, and, and she, was feeling, she was feeling depressed. Dispatcher recognized the low risk and specialized need of the response. Instead of sending fire, police, or EMS, she dispatched out an alternative response van to the location. A licensed professional counselor and a paramedic arrived and contacted the client. Uh, they were in civilian clothes, but they were monitored by 911 dispatchers, much like a, a fire, police, or EMS unit would be. The client received a mental health assessment on site at the time they called 911 from the counselor, and the paramedic checked their medications uh, and checked her blood pressure. Uh, they spent some time chatting with her, 
they have the time to chat with her, figure out what was going on, what's already been done, have you been connected with local resources? And they agreed that a local mental health facility with short-term housing options would be most beneficial. Counselor called ahead, they loaded up in the van, they drove immediately there, right after the 911 call. On their arrival, client was checked in and set up with temporary housing. The following day, social workers were able to review documentation from the previous night's events and coordinates the, coordinate that client's care. They took 64 minutes on that call. Um, as their shift continued, they answered multiple uh, 911 requests. In, in none of the cases were fire, police, or EMS dispatched to respond. In every one of those cases, alternative response providers gave focus and person-centric care immediately where it was needed, on site, at whatever time they arrived. So to wrap this up, um, alternative response programs, they, they really have the potential to positively impact communities in immediate and meaningful ways. Boots on the ground, right where the problem exists. Um, it's my belief that Independence Corps has the potential to fill a, a, an increasingly visible gap in our 911 services for our community and our responders alike. Uh, focusing dedicated and immediate resources and, and arguably some of the most significant issues uh, that we face. I, uh, I know that's a lot to throw at you, um, but I'd be happy to answer any, any specific questions about this. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Burrell, <clears throat> this is a, a massive, I don't know if it's a passion project, but uh, when we got our health department uh, back, that this has been a, a big discussion of services we think we should be involved with from a city level, but you are doing that. You work for IFD? Yes, sir. Okay. And so, <clears throat> uh, and you're working, I'm geeking out a little bit. You're working on actually developing this program right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Since I'm not trying to cross-examine you, but not at all. I, <laughs> it comes naturally. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you've been tasked to work on this, so that's what you've been putting together along with other mental health folks and our your chief. And that's correct. Most of my work has been in learning this and, and composing the report that that you all received because this is such a new program. There's only one program that's been doing it for any length of time, and that's up in Washington. They've been doing it since 78, and yeah. they're overwhelmed with requests. So we're trying to learn how to do this as, as we try to develop the program here. Let me ask you, you said that uh, Independence's numbers for suicide have exceeded the national average. Um, does that, is it bad enough where you can feel the effect of that on a day-to-day -day basis, like a, if, when was that first call you told us about, or that call that you told us about? That was at a, a prior service, not here, in a, in a prior career back sure. in 2010. So, can you feel a difference between in, then and now? Do our do our folks that do this job every day feel the increased pressure and the increased need for service? I, I, it's, I'd be speaking for a lot of people. Beside my, all I can speak of is myself, and I would say it, from my start of my career to now, we, there are calls, there's an increasing number of calls where we feel like we are powerless to do anything. Uh, poverty issues, you know, we can check someone's yeah. blood pressure, we can transport them to the hospital, we can't, we can't do anything to, to help them in that moment. Uh, you can't really put someone in a fire truck and take them to a safe location, take them to the right facility as opposed to an ER. Um, so I would say, it's visible and it's increasing, um, but it's slow, so you don't quite feel it until something significant happens and you realize, man, we run a lot more of these these days and feel a lot less powerless to do anything about it. Does that answer your question? Sure it does. Yeah, no, I was, I'm just curious how much it um, affects you guys that literally go to these calls all the time. So no, I appreciate that. Um, what else can we do as a, I'm, we're getting to that point, I suppose, but what, what can we do as, as city leadership, as a council, as a police and fire departments? Are we on the path to get there, or do you need something else? I'd say we're on the path. Um, we need to continue to, to work out what these processes look like in our system. I, 
I meant what I said about this being a paradigm shift in what we do. Yep. Um, it involves us sorting 911 calls from the point that, that call comes in. And as you can appreciate, 911 calls by their very nature sometimes can be frantic. So trying to figure out what that call looks like and then being able to decide, does this get a fire truck? Does this get a police officer? Do we send two unarmed people in a van separate of everyone else? Um, so I would say what we need is simply more time and, and more awareness to work through these problems and figure out what would work best for our community. I um, personally just want to thank you for the work that you're doing on this. I, I get the paradigm shift part. My dad's retired police. He's sitting right behind you. And uh, I, I get that. Um, I get that. But I, we need it, I feel. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Burrell. Mr. Burrell, thank you for coming and talking about this. It's, it's not an easy thing to talk about in, mm -hmm. in a community nationally. I mean, it's so multi-layered. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, as a nation, <clears throat> Our answer to everything is just throw lots of money at it and make it go away, and obviously that's not working. So a couple things. You, you mentioned the CDC, and they've seen the uptick. Did they give any reason, any change, uh, notable change in, in the increase? Was it from isolation? Because, you know, this was during COVID, so we were a much more isolated uh, community, we're much more isolated families. We're much more isolated individuals, and we we lost our ability to trust. Did they did they give any uh, indication for that that we can look at and, and begin to ask questions about? I've I have read a whole lot of theories, and and all I can tell you is there are there are wrong answers and there are long answers to that question, <laughs> but um, but. Uh, that, that would be a question beyond my expertise. Yeah. Um, I, probably a combination of those factors, why it's particularly higher in independence, um, why those numbers are increasing. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable even venturing an answer. I'm sorry. Well, I, I guess, and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, because mm -hmm. I think these are the questions that have, you know, people are asking. But for us to be good stewards with the, you know, the precious tax dollars we have to increase the department, to increase training, to increase education. Um, we've got to do this the right way that best serves our community. So I, I, I didn't think you had the answers because I don't, I, I've read a lot about it too. And I, and I just wonder, you know, as you put together something more um, detailed for us, you know, how, again, mm -hmm. with all trying to, to cover as many of the layers as we can. Is that something that you think you can at least give us the, the ability to, you know, the foundation to start from and then to build on? Of course, nothing's gonna be perfect, but if we continue to work together and provide what you need down the road, maybe we, you report quarterly, semi-annually, you know, and just figure it out, and working close with our health department. I think we, I think we can be leaders in this I'd like to see us be leaders in the state and Absolutely. in mental health. That'd be my desire. So I appreciate it. And if there's, I, I may call you and reach out and have more conversation. But I do appreciate what you've invested tonight thus far. I know there's more, so. Absolutely. And if I can, if I can, I, I don't know, um, I don't know the why, but something that I'm fairly convinced of is People, people are most uh, vulnerable is the wrong word, but open, open to help when they call 911. Um, that's a reach out. Even on the, even on the what we would probably call minor 911 calls, that's someone reaching out and saying, "I've, I've reached a point. I, I need something beyond me." And and a, and a challenge that our system as a nation has is that takes place days later. You know, we have ERs open overnight, but our ERs are packed already with other things. When you have a heart attack come through the front door, understandably, you're not going to be talking with that, that someone, someone who's struggling with mental health, substance abuse. That point of contact is, is, when, is when it seems like the most change can be made. And so if we can reach people um, with help directly related to their needs at that point when they're reaching out, um, I don't know how that affects outcomes. In fact, it's, 
very clear that there's no conclusive proof that it does change outcomes, but that's when they're most vulnerable and most open uh, to making making changes that can be impactful. Is that is that kind of yeah? Your and, and I just want I just want to commend you. Uh, the compassion that that we hear and see from you, you know, you are the best of what public service looks like, and and um, we're we're grateful as a city to have you working to bring those type of answers. So we're not asking you to bring those answers tonight. We're just glad we've got someone that cares enough to want to dive into a very complicated issue. And, and I'm grateful for the, the, uh, the folks that, that serve us. You are a great um, uh, public servant and, and we appreciate that compassion in you and, and that leadership in you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else other? Just a, just a quick comment, and, and I would just, uh, like the others, uh, thank you for the work you've done on this and, and look forward to um, the continuing awareness of the issue and of ways that we can uh, support your work. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, there's no doubt that in our society that this is an increasing um, occurrence and uh, affects people in, in lots of different ways and so if there are things that we can do then certainly and I, I'm guessing and hoping maybe that uh, we might see some uh, kind of a uh, uh, something in the in the budget process uh, connected to this and so uh, hopefully that would be the case and Adam I think you wanted to add something to it and it was my fault and I missed you a couple times back so please forgive me not a problem sir uh, it actually allows me to address one of the questions that you're you're driving at mr fears um and i'll be i'll be real quick uh so part of the next steps here uh is is a pilot program that's what we're we're driving towards here and if you recall uh in the american recovery plan act spending plan that the council approved i don't know several months ago this pilot program is funded through that so what you're seeing uh here is a result of that work and continued work in that direction there's uh, several items that have been brought to the brought to our attention through through this work that we'll need to address but we're grateful that we have uh, some funding here to work on this program and and tweak it and, and as we go along here mr. Norris how much was that funding I, I don't recall <clears throat> I believe one hundred and twenty hundred and fifty thousand dollars we can almost make a one life flight for that, can't we? <laughs> we <Maybe. laughs> I'm glad we have a start, though. No. Thank you, Mr. Norris. Uh, anything else? I just wanted to say thank you for your work. Um, what I really liked about your presentation tonight was you began with a story that clearly had compassion from your heart to say this is why, this is what that instance drove me to what can we do to solve an issue like that. And I just thought that was incredibly compelling, well done, and I cannot say thank you enough for your work and, and leading us off with that great story that obviously impacted you and impacted all of us once you told the story. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You bet. Sure. All right, Sam is gonna introduce our next speaker. Remember, we have two more here. Yes, uh, and I would also encourage each of you, his full report is attached to the agenda for tonight. Um, incredibly well done. Our next speaker is Ms. Julie Pratt with Comprehensive Mental Health. She's been with Comprehensive for about 16 years as a licensed professional counselor. The last four of those years, she's been the president and CEO and most recent uh, merge. She led the merge between Comprehensive Mental Health and Burl, uh, Behavioral Health Services, which has now put Comprehensive on, on the map as one of the, the largest um, behavioral health services in our region. So that's that's pretty exciting. I think with uh, Julie's presentation, you're gonna see that she, she um, wants to make a world where people feel comfortable talking about mental health. So I'm excited for you guys to listen to her. I'd like to move forward. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Julie Pratt. I'm the uh, president of the Kansas City region. Um, it's my new title with um, Comprehensive Following Our Merger. I thought I might start by answering, you know, helping John out and answering some of your questions that you had asked. Um, and I, I appreciate those detailed questions. Um, I don't know that independence is, is a lot different in some of our rates and some of the things we're seeing across the entire state of Missouri, um, which is unfortunate. But I think you're seeing a comfort level um, in people talking about mental health and substance use issues. That is certainly a shift in the last couple of years. 
um, some of our suicide rates. I think it's difficult to compare data over the years as well. Um, I think you find coroners in the past used to um, put down um, a different cause of death to save the families. Um, any, um, I don't know, additional um, grief or shame that they might experience um, by family members dying of suicide. And I think you see a shift in that as well, along with that st stigma decreasing. So it's really hard to get good comparable data on rates, um, but you certainly do see a shift in um, people being comfortable talking about mental health and substance use issues and grateful for that having shifted in the last couple of years. So I don't know if that helps with some of your questions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's going on and what we're doing um, for Eastern Jackson County and, and for Independence. Um, we did recently go through a merger with um, Borough Behavioral Health. And um, some of those reasons why um, Comprehensive had seen some significant growth over the last few years, but we had reached our cap as a small organization in the Community Mental Health Center in the state of Missouri. We're wearing multiple hats like a lot of organizations, and there's only so much as a nonprofit that you can continue to ask your staff to do. And we had reached that cap, just could not ask our staff to do any more. But to continue to reach the needs of the people in the community and continue to grow our services, we had to look for a partner in the community that had similar cultures um, to what um, we had in approaching our staff and the services. And we found that with Burl. And on this map, I don't know if you can see, um, kind of the blue is their footprint in the state. And then you can kind of see where our footprint up is up in um, Independence. Um, we do have some substance use services within Kansas City. But the partnership does allow us to offer more services and to serve more people. Um, we're specifically looking at hoping to expand our workforce. And I don't know that this data is any different for any business um, in the last couple of years. But in mental health organizations, 97% of the organizations surveyed find it difficult to recruit employees, and they're also showing difficulty in retaining employees at 82%. Um, since the beginning of this year, um, the merge finalized at the end of December, and so since January 1, we've added 58 new staff. That's a 12% increase in what we'd had previously, and we hope to continue to show that growth through this year. One of the bigger highlights and something that has been super important is the additional um, providers in our psychiatry and our med clinic. And at this time, we have a total of seven psychiatrists and three nurse practitioners, psychiatric nurse practitioners. So that's an additional two full-time psychiatrists, two part-time psychiatrists, and a child psychiatrist. And that really helps in being able to improve access for people to the medication services. So far in 2022, we've served um, 3,562 3, people. That's just since January 1st. Just some general statistics, about a quarter of those are enrolled in our substance use programs, and about 22% of those are youth, ages 17 or under. I have some information on here about our admission diagnoses. I think if you'd looked at this earlier in 2021, and our overall admission diagnoses, you would have seen opioid disorder on there as a top diagnosis. That has dropped off in the last year, but it is still a top diagnosis in our substance use program specifically. As you can see, since uh, 2017, we've seen a 40% increase in our clinic population overall. I can tell you that our staff hasn't increased by 40%. So these are some of the services that we provide. We do have a very unique service mix. And Comprehensive officer, office, offers both the behavioral health services and the recovery services that are listed on there. At this time, we don't offer develop, developmental disability services that are on there. But I did want to list those. Those are services offered by Borough Behavioral Help, Health, and I am hopeful that we can add that to our service mix. Um, but we are offering um, a lot of assessment services, um, individual um, therapy and counseling. Um, we have access to psychiatry and medication management groups, um, crisis intervention. We have a wide array of substance use services, including medication-assisted treatment. Um, crisis intervention and some 24-hour treatment for stabilization, which is what I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about further. So Burl is the leader um, in the state for uh, behavioral health crisis centers. 
They are consulting with a lot of other centers across the state in that and have had a behavioral health crisis center open for the last two years. So it has a huge impact on the community in being able to offer quick access to services, but it also offers a very um, heavy financial impact and savings to the community as well. Um, this slide shows you kind of the um, crisis cycle and kind of John's presentation kind of speaks to this a little bit as well. So we have a lot of individuals in the community that will enter a mental health crisis. They contact 911, they're taken to hospitals, emergency rooms, they're taken to jails, and then they're just released. So this cycle just continues. We're hoping to break that continuous circle and offering a behavioral health crisis center, that's the BCC, which includes a rap rapid access unit, which will also enable us to uh, access services rapidly for those individuals, keep them connected long-term to those services. Those services that they can get include crisis stabilization beds or just connecting them to long-term services, which I had included on that menu of services, outpatient therapy, medication management, any community support services that we offer. We have residential treatment facilities. So we're hoping by being able to connect people with this 24-7 crisis facility, we can break that cycle. There's a lot of state, regional, and na national interest. That top picture is showing you the construction that's happening at a facility here in Independence. That's a picture of me on there with our board of directors here in Independence. The pictures on the bottom are some of the borough um, staff and their facilities. You can see Senator Roy Blunt on there. He's a huge supporter of mental health services in the state of Missouri. We would not be where we are today without the support of Roy Blunt and some of the legislation, some of the dollars that he's brought into the state of Missouri. Um, I don't know that you can say Missouri is a leader in a lot of things. We are in behavioral health services. People look to us for what we're doing. This is some of Burl's data from when they opened their Behavioral Health Crisis Center and some of the numbers of people that they're serving in that facility every month. So you can see they've had over 3,000 contacts in that Behavioral Health Crisis Center and they're serving between 100 and 200 people there every month. This is what is happening as far as those admission status for those clients. 9% um, of the people served um, are not being admitted for any services. They're being referred back out to the community um, with other resources. 21% um, of those are being scheduled with a bridge session. So those clients are open into services and they are being um, bridged into services through the crisis center until they'll, they're connected long term into outpatient services with Borough Behavioral Health. The acute stabilization are those crisis stabilization beds within that crisis center. So clients are able to stay in those crisis beds um, three to five days until they're able to stabilize and then connect it with long-term services. I'm sorry, that's the long-term stabilization. And that acute stabilization is about a 23-hour observation. So this gives you some data on what the clients are receiving. And then these are the reasons for admission. So the acute stabilization, which is the less than 24 hours, most of those are for mental health reasons. That long-term admission, you can see that the admissions, the reasons um, for admission are, are pretty equal in regards to mental health or substance use. Here's some dollars that show you the community savings attached to a behavioral health crisis center. So table, table one shows you the rapid access unit um, cost avoidance for the behavioral health crisis center, and this is the one that's in Springfield showing you the low estimates up to the high estimates of what they're showing in data for community savings. Table two shows you compared to a facility in Wichita, which is a facility they visited and mo uh, modeled um, their uh, services off of when they opened their um, access unit. And that's cost avoidance at year one. This does kind of match um, what we're showing as estimates here for independence. Um, in talking and coordinating with um, Center Point Medical Center, about 8% of their emergency room visits are behavioral health related. So they're referring probably about 60 individuals per month um, for psychiatric inpatient visits. And we're estimating that we can decrease um, those referrals by about 40 to 50%. So that's about a decrease in 324 admissions. We know that a psychiatric mission costs about $10,000. We also know that those individuals are usually um, repeating to the emergency rooms as well as to the psychiatric admissions. So let's just do a low estimate and say that happens twice 
We know it happens more than that. Two months of outpatient care is approximately $1,800. So based on that, over a 12-month period, we're looking at $5.9 million in savings. So this is some direct feedback from a woman that was served at the Behavioral Health Crisis Center in Springfield. Just to add a personal touch, so grateful to the people who work here to save my life, grateful for the foundation they provided for my recovery. If you have a loved one struggling with addiction, they can help. I'd like to offer and answer any questions. Anybody has Thank anything? You. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, is our substance is substance abuse addiction being uh, considered a mental health problem? Behavioral health is the term that encompasses both of those. Okay. Substance use and mental health. Behavioral health. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, My mind just totally went blank. Anybody else? I'll come back to it. No problem. Welcome to my world. Yeah. There you go. Uh, anybody else? Other questions? And my question is, and, and this is a novice question, and I'm not an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it, it's a thought to me that a lot of people have mental health issues try to relieve that stress through either alcoholism or drug addiction or drug use or things like that to try to just how can I stop this, this sense of pain that I have? And so when you put both of those together, that's probably to deal with that, you know, that merging of data. There's just no way to say this one's a substance abuse issue and this is a mental health issue, if I'm uh, hearing correctly. About 75% of the clients in our substance use program also have a mental health diagnosis, so are co-occurring. Right, so it's kind of a, mm -hmm. and then it's the kind of the chicken or the egg question. Right, is, I was wait, getting raised it, yeah. Pardon me? I was getting ready to say chicken or the egg issue. Right. So you, uh, you read my mind or I read your mind. I'm not sure what happened, but it was a mind meld right there. So thank you. But I just think this is excellent and great work. And I have uh, I visited your facility on a number of occasions prior to you joining the institution. And so uh, just a great job. And you guys just do great work. Yeah. So thank we're you. hoping that we have this crisis center open pending ability to have staff hired um, July 1. OK, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, Councilman Hobart. Are yes. You? Okay. I figured it out. Um, it, and I, uh, I saw in the uh, Mr. Burrell's report that you were consulted on that. Are, are, is your uh, organization going to be contributing to, partnering with, providing social workers maybe for this response team? If I could give him that qualified mental health professional today for that project, I would. Okay. So you're you're all in. Yes. If, if and when we get there. Yeah. It is difficult. It, there's still um, certain uh, positions and level of education that we're struggling to get hired, that yep. being one of them. Yeah, I'd have him staffed with a qualified mental health professional doing that. Yeah. Fully supportive of, of his pilot and what he's doing and that co-responder model is fantastic. We're we doing looked that at with those. the police department. We Yep, our uh, our health department uh, uh, looked at uh, Dr. Morris. Is that right? I always call yes. him Mor Myers instead of Morris. Dr. Morris and Ruckman, uh, they looked at a number of programs around. I noticed you mentioned Denver Star program. There was, I think Minneapolis has one, and there's one out in Cahoots model. Yeah. Cahoots mm -hmm. and one out in Salem. More anyway. Uh, that would be incredibly progressive mm -hmm. for anywhere in the state. I mean, no one's doing this around here. Mm -mm. They aren't. And it would, it would definitely directly affect our homeless population as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alleviating that pressure off of those, those first responders that would be taking care of other emergencies. Right. Absolutely. Okay, yep. that's, all, that's all I have for you right now. I get, you always talk to me, so I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Any, any other questions? Uh, excuse yeah. me, one more question. 
Go ahead. Just, just a quick Sorry. question. So the facility that you're building, um, I'm not familiar with where that is. Maybe somebody else, maybe other people here don't know where that is either. Can you tell us where it is and how, what the scope of that, how large it's going to be and things of that nature? Um, this will be a smaller temporary gap filler crisis center until we're able to get a larger one built. It'll have four crisis stabilization beds and then six rapid access chairs, for lack of a better word. Um, we're not limited to six people coming in there, but um, and it's over off a of medical center parkway by the power and light building. It faces the park. It's in a current building that we already had. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. I'd also like to bring to your attention that um, next Monday, you guys will actually be uh, voting on an agreement with Julie Pratt and the, the Crisis Center um, that will be over on 39th Street um, by Center Point. So, uh, our last speaker tonight is David Struther. Uh, in speaking with IFD and IPD, they said he needs no introduction. He will do a solid job on his own. But I will tell you that he is a United States Marine Corps veteran, turned firefighter, turned psychotherapist. So you guys are in for a treat. Mr. Mayor, City Council, uh, I'm a plain speaker. So <laughs> if I offend any delicate sensibilities, it is um, I've listened to Mrs. Pratt and John just give you guys some incredible, you know, I mean, mental health is such an important thing, but um, I'm here to answer a couple of questions. You know, they called me out, of course. Um, Independence has a huge place in my heart because I watched your firefighters fight for each other in ways that I didn't see other cities do. You know, the reason why you guys got Cigna to budge, Cigna, was because of those guys over here and over there. They stood up on each other's shoulders and they forced them to go. I am a um, subject matter expert. I'm a trauma clinician. So that's my specialty, that's what I do. What makes me a bit different is I've also lived several lives. I was a Marine, am a Marine, deployed to Afghanistan in 2002 in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Got out, started to pursue my career, ended up getting cancer, stage three, that came with its own set of difficulties. And I thought it would be an awesome job to slow my life down by becoming a firefighter and opened up a whole new level of interesting uh, experiences. And I worked with Lee Summit for about six years. Um, I stopped and I started working in corporate America. I created several programs. Uh, I think I might have the single honor or, I don't know if I'm crazy, but I've started more programs for first responders, military and veterans than um, anybody in the state's history. Um, from the STAR program to Valor to Valiant to all these different things I did, it's, a, it's more than a passion project. It's literally what I think I'm here to do. I think that one of the things that I wanted to really tell you guys is you don't have just an issue with stabilization. That's very crisis oriented that you have an issue with treatment. This particular group of people have um, a level of cultural competency that certain professions need. To be honest, in order to help these guys, they want to make sure that you can understand them. I can't tell you how many firefighters and cops I've helped that told me horror stories of them traumatizing their therapist just by telling them what was going on. You guys a city last year alone went through a lot. But as I started to treat so many people from independence, I realized you guys have been getting your asses. Oh, sorry. Can I say that? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. You guys have been getting your butts kicked for a very long time. I hear so many people's name come up. Terry, not just Blaze, not just Chad Sappenfield. I hear all these people that have been there. So you had asked a question, sir, and you had said, can they feel it? Hell yeah, they can. Hell yeah, they can. John's being humble. He can't speak for everybody. I will. I treat them. They absolutely can. You guys, rough estimates, and I work with KCF. D, the city of Kansas City has hired me to do stuff. I'm speaking in Lawrence Thursday. I work with a Lenexa. I work around our metropolitan area helping develop programs and help. 
it may be anecdotal, it may be a little qualitative. I'd say that your department has about 20% working sick people. People that are coming in that are dealing with serious mental illness, substance abuse, and they're still coming in because like they'll say, they don't wanna let their other guys down. That's kind of how they look at that. That's kind of what's going on. I have been impressed with independence above all, your public service. I've helped your dispatchers. I've helped your cops. But you guys have really pulled together when it was needed. But there are, there are no throughputs. No one has figured this thing out. There's no city that has it figured out. So I know a lot of times we look and we say, can we lean on it? You guys got to remember, when we're talking about that pressure they're feeling, you got to remember that there was once upon a time, can I pick on you old guys, right? Tell us what your call load was when you first got on. How many calls did you run in a year? Here yeah. Probably around 9,000. Right. Hey guys, how many calls are you running in a year right now? Do you see what I'm saying, guys? See, you can take at best Maybe one dead kid that'll affect you, maybe two. We're talking about an order of times three. How much can you see in a year? How much can you do in a year before it starts to have tangible effects? Before it starts to affect your family? These guys know because I tell them all the time. A lot of them are running around thinking they're doing great, right? You know, they like to tell me that they snap, right? They're like, I was doing great and then I just snapped. And I say, well, how? Well, I came in and I saw a toy down and I ended up screaming at my family and I don't know why I did that, David. I just went from zero to 10. That's a psychological improbability. Unless you got it nailed through your prefrontal cortex or TBI or CTE, you don't go from zero to 10. What happens is you've been so damn angry at eight for so long, you've normalized it to a three. So you start giving yourself credit for stuff you shouldn't. Like, I didn't choke the crap out of somebody today. I kept my job today. And then when something happens, you start to see the stair step. This is a matter of not just public safety, but this is how you start to put your hands around it. You guys are already in a free fall. We're not asking, do we need to shoot? It's already there. We're trying to figure out how we land. You know, in the Marine Corps, we were taught first to fight, tip of the spear, those type of things. You know, we run forward. What's interesting is that same ethos is there as a firefighter. It's to get out in front and deal with whatever danger, and we'll figure it out on the back end. What's very interesting is with all my training that I got from doing intense calculations to you know, learning how to lift and all that, no one once told me how to handle a bad call. There's a cultural component that just says, hey guys, you're built for this, kind of suck it up. And they are, but they need our support as well. I could do a lot of different things in my life than argue with hard head people over if they're mentally ill or not, right? but I choose to because it's the greatest gift they give us. These are our heroes. It's all great for us to put stickers on our car and say all that, but these are the men and women every day that come out here and do something. I got out of corporate America because of uh, a couple of reasons, but I'm a bit of an orthodox therapist. I lasted as long as I could. I did 10 years in and I built all these programs, but when I got out, I created my own and I named it Valiant. I named it that because there's a certain type of courage that service providers have. It's a certain type of courage that it takes to get up and keep doing the same thing, not understanding why, but just doing it. My program, we hold people's courage for them until they get it back. I currently have active duty military. Our bases still support me. I have veterans. I have first responders from all over this state and other states. They come and they sit in this room and they listen and they learn these skills. It's not that these guys can't do the job. It's that the way we've been taught to do it is really, really hard. All these advances. I mean, you're talking about these old guys. They probably were taught to put a beard in their mouth to filter out smoke, right? And now we're really running around with underwater scuba gear doing that. But those same guys weren't taught how to process a call. Those same guys don't understand, no matter what generation it is, how it goes. A lot of times I end up doing citywide trainings for different cities to help them. And I always say I want all the leaders in there too, not just the young guys, all the leaders. What I found though recently is, I knew it, I knew it on an instinctual level, but I found it more common is the families need support. The other staff, non-direct staff, non-public safety staff, they need support. Um, 
I'm pretty much in the next couple of months going to open up my IOP to other people, not just our niche. I got some therapists I'm training and doing that because when I'm talking to a spouse, I hear the pain in their voice too. When I'm talking to someone, you guys got a, uh, I won't throw anybody out, but you guys got a really good city as far as people that are wearing suits every day, forcing their friends to come and get help. I get a lot of calls from city independence people who say, hey, David, so-and-so told me about you. Could you go help my friend? And I always follow that up with, well, who's helping you? Oh, it's not about me right now. Just help my friend out. Just do these things. You guys have um, one of the hardest cities to work in, right? It's a running joke how hard things are here. And I heard the gentleman you know, earlier talking about development. I think that's all right. But when I hear that, I think about more people and more calls. I think about what are they going to do? Because it's great to get some big shiny thing in there, and I support it. I want your city to grow. But if you bring in another 10,000 people, that doesn't just diffuse throughout the world. These guys got to lift that up as well. And your city gets to be on the forefront of helping them in a lot of different ways. Not all cities are as progressive as you guys are. I've spoken at a lot of places. I've been behind the scenes and in front of them. I've done that. And frankly, what I deal with a lot is misinformation and people not understanding mental illness. Every one of us can experience mental illness. You just don't have a therapist around to tell you that. It takes a lot to be able to stand up. And I'm glad that these guys showed up. This is how much they care about it. This is what it is. But the truth of the matter is they do need help. They need a lot of it. And it's not something that you guys can wait on. I can show you guys... If it didn't breach HIPAA, <laughs> I can show you guys plenty of people who are calling in sick because they are hungover, because they are depressed, because they did put a gun to their head for those three days. And now it's not just out of sight, out of mind. These things are affecting people every day. So I came here today just to entreat on their behalf, not just mine, on their behalf that you guys do put more effort and pressure on them because they won't raise their hands themselves. They won't do it. They'll say they're fine and keep going, but I'm the one sitting with them on the couch and they're not fine. And these things are hard. And your city in particular, your city in particular, has given me so many people in the last year. Blaze's death, Sappenfield's death, these things have serious effects on the old and the young. And it's there and it's, I hope you guys are like me. You did this job because you care about people because you want to be able to make choices and make decisions that have true effect. This is one of those things. Um, there are a couple of really big, I'm not gonna mess with Chris or anybody, there are a couple of big people in your departments on PD and FD and dispatch that I know would be willing to speak up and help you guys if you wanted to develop some things. You know, What I do is all outpatient. I love what Ms. Platt's talking about because we need crisis, but I'm treatment. I do a lot of outpatient work. I come in and they stay with me for 10 to 12 weeks, three hours a day, three times a week at the minimum. And one of their biggest concerns is, how do I pay for this? How do I, how can I afford this? Is there, these cities don't have time for them off like that. They have to use their own sick time, their own vacation time to treat an illness that was brought on by the very things that they did to help us. That's a travesty in my eyes but I still help them and we still try to work around as much as we can. So I just wanted to come up here today and just talk to you guys about that and give you more of a firsthand look at the mental welfare of your city and those guys and girls that are doing this and someone who's treating them firsthand. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions, Jim? Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Proceed. Thank you yes, for sir. your service, Simplify. Oh, Appreciate there we go. Real man in here, right? That's right. So, um, <laughs> I I love what you're saying tonight because if we because we have gone through so much in this city, and if we if we as a council as city leaders if we fail them then we we're failing our community, and and um, I've watched them walk through some very difficult moments. They live their lives in in now situations. It's very much now where the rest of us are doing. You know, we're doing projects and we've got these goals and, and it's very hard for us to understand a couple things that they, they go out and, and they run into burning buildings, which, you know, who does that, right? And so they're, they're A type personalities and when, you know, when they're strong, they're extremely strong and when they're weak, they're, they get really weak. 
And so as a city, if, you know, these are the things that, that I, I, I think uh, we have to have more conversations about because they always want to be strong around us. And that's and that's uh, absolutely that's hard. So, thank you for bringing that awareness to us. I think we we do we wherever we start, we have to start with our own, and then because they're strong, they can go out and, and be strong when they they deal with those now situations. Yes, but, sir. Uh, thank you for for all your careers, <laughs> yeah, and but mainly thank you for your calling. Yes, that that's and that's what you bring to us. So. Grateful that you're in our city and you, that uh, you came up here tonight. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Mr. Steve. Mayor. <clears throat> thank you. Um, you you uh, made a real impression on me at Chad Sappenfield's service, and it's been a made a huge impression on me going to a number of services. For our first responders. So, this is me, this is us asking you for help. Yeah. Our guys, um, you know, I mentioned it before, my dad's one of those old guys sitting right there. And so is his buddy Bob sitting right next to him. And, uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't grow up in a time uh, when mental health was talked about. You were just weak or couldn't handle it or suck it up or Absolutely. Get, get called names. And I was really impressed at the time that I spent with some of the firefighters, some of the police after those services, that they actually were talking about mental health. Yes. Um, I was floored by that. Um, my dad was, my birth dad, my bio dad was schizophrenic. And that was very much at a time when it was not um, acceptable to be schizophrenic. Not that it is now, but you can talk about those things now. And lots and lots of people are depressed, lots and lots of people have anxiety. Like you said, there's a good percentage that function because that's what you do. So my question for you is, what can we do for you so that you can help us better? You said you could make a program. You said you could do trainings. Yes, I do all those things. I would get with you guys and assess your actual needs and create it from there. The cities that contract with me, that's how the conversations go. I don't wanna come in and say some things that don't pertain to what it is. I wanna know. Now what makes me maybe a maverick in a sense is I have an inside track because I'm already treating your city. I already know some of the things, but I also wanna know what constraints or what thoughts you guys have. You know, it's very easy for someone to come here and say, give me the world, and it's like, but do you know how we get there, right? I teach my guys every day, speed isn't more important than direction. We have to know where we're going, not just try to get there quickly. You know, so this is the type of thing, you know, I give the Sappenfields so much love and respect for asking me to do that that day because so many people would have tried to make that day, he just died. They wouldn't want it to be an honest discussion about mental health and suicide and his family and the department were very gracious in saying, hey, go up there. I knew Chad, I treated Chad. He was my friend. A week before he took his own life, he had called me to come up to one of your stations because they had a rough day. That's who Chad was. So to get up there and give him honor, that's what it was about. So I have no problem in his name and all these other guys and girls' names that I help helping you guys out. That's why I came here. My wife, I have four kids that I don't get to see as much. I told my wife what I needed to do today. She said, just try to get out of there early. <laughs> she knew I was going to come here and do this. She knew that I would be here and available for those. So that is a conversation, Mr. Hobart, we would have to have. But I, I don't stand on ceremony. I want to do the work. 
So we would have that conversation and we would look at what it takes to develop the things you're saying and what needs your city actually has. I'm actually working, weird enough, I'm working with Clay County Sheriff's Department right now. They're about to institute a sabbatical program for their sheriffs where they're going to, because these guys aren't going to do it, they're going to damn near manda mandate that everybody start to take sabbaticals and get a break two weeks, months. So there's different needs for different cities. So that would be my short form answer to you. Go ahead. Proceed. I, I, I failed to ask uh, Mr. Norris, uh, at, and you, when, if we have these discussions, I think something you said that was real key, that, that a lot of them, you know, they have to take their own time off and they have to pay for these things. That's a reflection on us. How do we, who, who's important in, in the service of our community? And so whatever discussion we have with you, we need to put together the ability for whoever the professional is to evaluate that they need this time and that the cost should not be um, something that they have to, to worry about. There's already cities that I'm working with that, you know, pay deductibles, pay full costs. They make sure that, and, and it has to be a part of the job. They'll, we'll create other things for things that are maybe marital stress, but the part of the job things are things that they experience while on a job. I work with cities right now that cover it fully. Not all do though. Well, we, we need to do better to, to make sure that when they're asked to serve our community, Yes, sir. Yeah, whether it's with the mental health issue, whether it was COVID, we need to give them back those pers that personal time. Yes, and, sir. And I know we we had something on last year that we need to probably revisit and find out what we can do to do that. Yes, sir. Because uh, again, if we don't serve them, then we're really not serving our community our community properly, yes. and that and that's troubling. So. Yes, sir. So anything that you have in terms of discussion, dialogue, if you can bring what other cities do, yes, you know that works. Absolutely, doesn't mean that's a fit for independence, but give us just some, some things, give us yeah, some, things some parameters to work with, right? Yes, sir. So I appreciate it. Thank yes, you. sir. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. No, absolutely. That's why we're here. Uh, uh, you know. I wanted to comment one more thing, please. Uh, you know, I'm not going to allow you to have two comments. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was very kind the first time. Year. I'm not this sure to do this the second doing, time. Right? I, need, <laughs> I need to get up here, right? <laughs> Next year I'm over there. David, forgive me. I just had to zing him. So I hope um, we're still friends. Absolutely. I've, earned, I've earned a lot more than that from him, I promise you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, in the two years that I've been on council, uh, I have not heard somebody stand at that podium and accuse us of being progressive. And now I've heard it twice in one night, and it's all dealing with mental health. And if that's the only thing we're number one in, then I'd like to be number one by a wide margin. Yes, sir. So I don't speak for everyone, but I speak for myself, and you have my, my, my full support. Uh, do your plan, man. Yes, sir. What you've wanted to do and can't do. You guys are in trouble. <laughs> what you... What you, uh, the, I'm serious about, I'm dead serious about that. And I know the chiefs <laughs> will support it, uh, but let's be progressive. Yes, sir. Please. You know, there's a reason you, you've done all those careers you've had led you to right now. Very true. I'm a firm believer in divine providence, a firm believer. Me and God got a weird relationship, but I know he puts me where I'm supposed to be. Well, you're right. I believe, fully believe you're there right now. So this is Independence asking you for help. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very, very much for all you've done for everybody individually and hopefully what we can do in, in any time soon. You know I hold you to that if you tell me that, man to man. I'm that type of guy. So if I start bothering you, <laughs> just know. <laughs> Call me every day. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Every single day. Thank you, sir. And if I don't do what I said I do, then get up there and tell everybody about it. Thank you, sir. You guys need it. I'm Thank serious. You, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You sure you don't need a third time? <laughs> <laughs> Just want to clarify. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I broke the moment. Um, Anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Strother, just a question. Yes, the kind of services that you're talking about, are those ever covered under work comp? Yes, but 
um, as you guys probably know, the work comp laws and the maneuvering of it is horrendous in Missouri. There are so many different barriers, so many. There are lawyers that make their entire living on just fighting work comp. You know, it is very hard. It's unwieldy for these. And here's the problem. A lot of times you're dealing with people who have taken the strongest step by asking for help. Any barrier stops that for them. Right. So a lot of times I do work with workman's comp, but if I'm going to be off the record, I do a lot of pro bono when it comes to workman's comp because they'll never pay me or they'll never see that. But that doesn't mean that person doesn't need help. So sometimes I just incur the cost, which is why I'm not in corporate America anymore. <laughs> Can't get away. <laughs> it's not a good business model, but it's a good me model. So, yes, um, that, was, that would be one of the things that I would bring to you guys is having a sure throughput, a liaison or what, how do these guys get from point A to point B because I deal with about 40% of my caseload is trying to work through workman's comp in some way or another. And you guys are better than Kansas where they don't even recognize PTSD as a work-related. So it's even though it's bad here, I deal with people that it's even worse for. So. Yeah, I would definitely like to see how you guys were. Are you loggers as well? Yeah, <laughs> we would definitely have to have conversations about what throughput for these guys are. Okay, thank you. So. Anything else? When you've got another chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Uh, I just want to say, uh, David, the first time I saw you was at Chad Saberfield's uh, funeral. There are few speakers, there are many speakers that are compelling. There are many speakers that are heartfelt. There are few that are mesmerizing, and you are mesmerizing. Thank you, sir. I, I, that day changed me, and it changed the way I looked at things. And when you can do that as a speaker, uh, and you came from the heart. You just, you didn't, there was no, there was no flash. There was no, this is heart. This is, this is who I am, and this and so, um, you're one of those, and I'll finish my comments on just using a Mark Twain quote. Uh, Mark Twain said, there, there, are, there are two great days in your life. The day you are born and the day you realize why. why. You're one of those lucky individuals that knows why. Yes, sir. Not all do, as you will know. Yes. And so, I am glad you're here. I'm glad what you do. And we'll see what we can do to help you help the men and women who help our community and keep it uh, safe. So I cannot say thank you enough for what you do. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you for you. your time. Okay. That completes our mental health overview for. Um, I had one more question, if I could, David. You might one more yes, question. Sir? Oh, don't come up here. Don't come up here. Do you provide Do you provide services for candidates in difficult campaigns? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Black Beach, exactly. <laughs> I'm just teasing, my friend. I'm just teasing. Oh, I did. I did actually have one more. Uh, oh, sure. Go ahead. Not sure. for him. <laughs> not for him. I forgot to ask it earlier. Nine eight eight. Can we get an update on nine eight eight and what it is and where we're at? I will ask Ms. Pratt to come up and discuss that. And I can get my pen. Um, nine eight eight will be the number that anyone can call in July when they're having a mental health crisis. So this will be set up um, to help divert all those calls coming into 911 and help alleviate that traffic into the dispatchers. The number will be set up to go directly into the current established mental health crisis lines, the suicide prevention lines, the current regional crisis line that we have in place. There is funding established in the Missouri state budget to help expand staffing in the crisis lines to help us as the community mental health center providers to beef up staffing and for the response to those calls. Um, so you will see um, some increased notification advertising about that, but in July, you'll see that sudden shift. So hopefully um, decrease a lot of that traffic and calls the um, dispatchers are receiving that we know that they're getting even just calls for general mental health crisis information. It's not even an urgent call. So we currently have co-responders that are sitting in there with them sometimes trying to help with that, but it's just, astronomical so hopefully that will help very much, very much appreciate that um, mr. Norris yeah that's it's already configured on our on city phones right now oh that's fantastic um, I was gonna ask you uh, could you make sure the city uh, participates in whatever 
advertising campaigns or social media or publicity that goes along with that is, yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pratt. Are you sure you're done? <laughs> you know, I just want to tease you, my friend. I just want to tease you. Is it okay, though? We're still friends? All right. Um, Mr. Norris, anything else uh, before we wrap up? Or any other council members, anything before we wrap up? Mr. No I'm sorry? Oh, there's more item on the agenda? Oh. Thank you. Fire away. Boards and commissions report. Yeah. Um, so we're looking to make appointments to the Japanese Sister City Committee. Recommendations have been made to reappoint Christy to Meyer, Dustin Henrik, and Hanoka Maju. If there's no objections, we'll add a resolution to the next agenda. Any objections, concerns? Okay. Next, the Sustainability Commission. We're looking to appoint Krista Savek. If there's no objections, we'll add a resolution to the next agenda. Okay, proceed. Okay, and then um, that takes us to the council committees. We are going to have several vacancies. Well, we already have several vacancies due to the changeover, and then we also have some upcoming expirations of term. Um, just to make it quick, if you guys can send me an email letting me know which one of these or if you're interested in multiple council committees that you're interested in being appointed to, then we can kind of fill those as we go along and I can add that to the next board report. I do wanna make special mention of audit and finance. So after doing some review of that particular board, it looks like now that Councilmember Hobart's mayor pro tem, you will serve automatically as an alternate on that board, so we'll need two positions filled for audit and finance. Uh, I'm interested in that. Okay, thank you. Are there any others that you guys want to give me some feedback on this evening? Check with John. I think he probably would still want to be on it. But any other? And there's a, we have to, council has to appoint the chairperson for that too, correct? That's correct. Okay. Any other ones we need? Nope, um, we do have several individual council appointments. I'd encourage you guys to take a look at the list and to provide applications for boards and commissions to people that you think would be good fits. We did open up the Charter Amendment Advisory Board, so if you have individuals who are interested, I'd have them get those applications in and just let my office know who you've submitted for those. Um, we'll get a resolution on the agenda once we get a pretty substantial amount of those filled with your appointments. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Norris, anything else? No, sir. All right. That means we're clear. All right. Yes, sir. Well, with nothing else said, we'll be adjourned. Thank you all.